starting out with Eric Blair's show. And tonight we have an interview with legendary punk rockers, The Damned. Dave Vanian, how you doing, buddy? Good evening. And Captain Sensible. How you doing, Captain? Hello there, Eric. Um, it's very nice to see you. Um, do you know Eric Blair is George Orwell's um, real name? Uh, uh, actually, I do know that, but I don't right. have any of his Did money. Did you steal Is that your real name, then? Yeah, Eric, Eric Blair. Blair. Is that? I know, I'm very For fortunate. I'm I have a lucky name. All right, hold on a minute. You think I'm an idiot? You're the idiots. You paid money to see me. Captain Sensible is my real name, though. There of course. Go. Yeah. We're, we're, uh, actually, you know, somebody just asked today, Captain Sensible, that is your real name? Yeah. Not really. No. How did you get that name? Oh, no. Well, I just... There you go. I'm not very sensible, to be quite honest. I used to drink all the drink in the dressing room and uh, go completely berserk. And so I, they, they just called me that name. I wasn't a captain either, you see. And I wasn't sensible, so... So how's the tour been for you guys so far, Dave? It's early days now, but it's been going pretty good. Yeah, we've still got another four weeks ahead of us. So we're into the first week. And it's been great. And now what, what are the, what's the audience reaction been like? What surprises me, especially uh, I've been noticing uh, people mouthing all the words to the new songs, which is, I'm surprised so many people have bought the album so quickly and they're, they're already knowing what we're doing instead of just relying on the old stuff. They know the lyrics better than we do, don't they? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> are you calling me a senile old fool again? The new album is actually amazing. Thank you. I got into it on a first listen basis. I'm glad you liked it. It's one of those albums where it varies. Some people uh, hear it for the first time and they're interested enough that once they hear it a few times, they really love different tracks, though. What's your favorite track? Um, you know, I like Democracy and I like She. Yeah, okay. The Everyone two. seems to have uh, a different favorite, but they seem to vary between four numbers, which are W and uh, Song.com as well. It's one of those albums you can put on and listen to every cut all the way through. I think that's because uh, the songs are so varied, though, as well. You know, you don't get tired of hearing uh, the same chord structures and ideas through every song. That's what's nice about it. It's a little musical journey for you. How did you guys beat the Sex Pistols in being one of the first UK punk bands to tour the US? Well, it wasn't a race. It was just one of those things where we, um, we were just there and we just did it. You know, we got the album out and suddenly Stiff Records said, you're going to America. And we'd never been out, out of England before, I don't think. Had you been out of England before? No. I've been no. to the Isle of Wight. <laughs> That's <laughs> as far as I'd been. So it was like, you know, we didn't know what the hell was, was happening. We, um, we hit America. And we were going to do the East Coast first and the West Coast. On the West Coast, we were supporting Tom Verlaine. We went through and we did CBGB's couple of nights there with the Dead Boys. And uh, reports started going back to the West Coast to uh, television about our shows. And suddenly they um, opted out of the tour. They said, oh, we don't want the damned on there anymore. So They well, heard about the chaos as well. They heard about the chaos. Yeah, yeah and I don't think they could have lived with that. Being that they were such uh, po-faced kind of well, genteel types. Yeah. The They're time. hardly hardened um, maniacs, are they? No. Television. So uh, we ended up on the West Coast with no money at all and no shows. But luckily our um, esteemed manager of the time, Jake Riviera, hassled around and got some shows for us and it went pretty well. What was it like working with Nick Lowe, the producer of your first album, Damn Damn Damn? And was that your first experience working with a producer? Well, it really wasn't the first experience because we had done... Do you remember we did three demos yeah. before that yeah. in this guy's... Uh, uh, Basically, under a staircase. Joby. Joby, Joby. Halo. In, was that his place? That was his name, Joby Halo. No, I meant the demos we right. did in the staircase with the other guy with the, the three track, the four oh, track right, machine, yeah, remember? Because yeah. we, uh, we did four tracks before we ever made the yeah. album. But yes, the album was the first, well, I suppose we call it a professional studio. I think the great thing about Nick Lowe was he, the, he was our producer, but he wasn't actually a producer. He hardly touched anything no. and, and he left it completely raw. And if you listen to the Pistols, um, album, it, that sounds kind of polished and slick, and our, our one, to me, just sounds like more of a punk album. How did it differ having Pink Floyd drummer Nick Mason produce your second album, Music for Pleasure? Oh, that's a, a total difference, I mean, Nick... We wanted Sid Barrett. We wanted Sid Barrett. <laughs> we, we said, they said, what producers do you want? We wanted Sid Barrett, because he was, you know, a strange individual out there. We thought he'd be a perfect choice, Sid Barrett and the Dam together. But we couldn't get Sid Barrett, and we, we got the drummer from the Pink Floyd instead, so it was a bizarre experience to say Sid, the least. Sid was off having a nervous breakdown, yeah. unfortunately, but the, the Damned and Sid Barrett together would have been a, uh, just the most bizarre combination. It might have made one of the best albums of all time. It could have been, yeah, or the worst. We'd have no idea. No idea, no. But it would have been fun to do that. But with Nick Mason, he was basically just a, a drummer who could produce to a certain extent, and 
It wasn't the best time for us because uh, Brian, just after that, split the band up. Brian James. It's as easy as that. Yeah, he just said, uh, I don't want to do it anymore, it's over. I realize he did have a lot of input as far as songwriting goes, but didn't you guys think like, hey, well, you could just take your toys and leave, but we're going to keep it going? Well, that's kind of what we did, but at the time, when he first said it, we had no idea it was going to happen. Okay. And we kind of just stood around and said, oh, what the hell are we going to do? You know, do we continue? But of course, Captain here wasn't just a bass player. He was a guitarist. And he, that's where he should have been from the beginning, I suppose. Really. I, jo I joined as a bass player basically because uh, Brian had vision. Uh -huh. He had this dream of this like sort of this dark, like sort of uh, um, heavy kind of uh, new vibed up like sort of kick-ass uh, group of some sort. There was no um, there was no punk movement no. at the time in London. You know, I didn't know that what Mick Jones and uh, Steve Jones and Johnny Rotten were doing would, would would be called a punk movement. None of us did. No. We all got, all got lumped together in this thing, you know, and um, and that's how that happened. During one of your reunion gigs, I guess as the Doomed, as you co were calling yourself for a while, uh, you actually had Lemmy from Motorhead play bass. Now, how did that come about? I, how did we get Lemmy in? Uh, you know, I always remember him being in the band for those gigs, but why we just didn't yeah. have a bass player, but I can't remember why. He was just flat. We used to go down drinking with him down Portobello Road. see him all the time, yeah. Yeah. He actually asked me to join Motorhead. Did he? But, um, yeah. I think it was just that Algae had gone and, uh, had he gone at that time? No, it was between Algae and... Just before Algae, just yeah. Just before Algae. We hadn't a permanent bass player. And he, you know, we asked him and he did it. He said it'd be great. Offered to help, him a fiver. Help us yeah. out to do a couple of shows. And he ended up um, being in the studio trying to record Ballroom Blitz with him. Mr. Sensible, uh, you're like the Eddie Van Halen of punk. Your playing is very fluid. I blame Hendrix myself. I just listen to a lot of that stuff and it kind of sinks in, you know. Yeah. You'll never be able to play as good as that. But, uh, but I, I've perfected the behind the... The behind the head bit, you know. Yeah. Like, at least I can do that. <laughs> Brian started Lords of the New well, Church. He's actually reformed uh, that band now. Steve Bader's is dead. Well, Steve's dead, but he's got a new singer, and uh, apparently it's sounding quite good. Really? So we we played with him not as that, but sort of. Uh, I suppose it's the early incarnation of what it would become in a, a show in in England. It was actually quite good. But it was weird to hear him playing New Rose and no, Nick Neat, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Again, because I haven't I haven't seen him for quite a few years. He lives in Brighton, though, which is uh, south of the south of England on the coast. Rat Scabby stayed on to play with you guys for a while, but where is he today? Well, he's probably locked up in the loony bin, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where he is these days. Wow. Yeah, I've lost contact with him. Last I heard, he was doing some um, weird sort of uh, uh, trance music stuff. But that's so that's he's gone totally mellow. He does a lot of that. He's doing a bit of wacky back here. <laughs> <laughs> he's pondering on the future of the universe. Yeah. So now what would you say were, were some of the highlights of the 80s for you guys? Well, it certainly wasn't the haircuts, that's for sure. <laughs> the shoulder pads were the shoulder great, pads, yeah. yeah. The Joan Collins look. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I don't know, you know, at, at the time, I didn't think the 80s had much going for it. But then in the 90s, I thought, well, maybe it did, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we never know how good we have it until it's gone, right? That's basically yeah, that's it. You, you, you never know how how good music <clears throat> is or how bad it is until you get to the next decade when you when it's even worse. Mm. Like, absolutely appalling, like music we're going through at the moment. All this R and B and like sort of all this really turgid boy and girl band. You know what I mean? The boy bands are the worst, I think. You know these kind uh, of right manufactured now. bands. You know. Yeah. You know, this is why. This is why the damned are back. You know, to wipe boy bands off the face of the planet once and for all. The right old, on. The oldest yeah. boy band in town. We are, yeah. <laughs> Out of all your solo efforts, which ones did you guys love the most? Naz and Punk Floyd and yeah. Well, you know, I, I still do the Phantom Chords thing now and again. Captain still does his stuff. We keep that going. It's not like it's a, it's just little projects where we do things slip them in where we can. Do you feel that's a healthy thing for a band to allow their members to go off and do things on the side? I do because I think uh, it's in a totally different field so it doesn't, it doesn't um, you know there's so much that you can do in a band and there's other things that just wouldn't be right for the damned and it's great yeah. to be able to to do that you know if he wants to play for 40 minutes on one solo or something yeah. spaced <laughs> exactly. out it wouldn't, it wouldn't be so good in new rows you know yeah. but or some of that disco pap that I did earlier in the you know, well, say captain, say what? captain, say yeah, what? Exactly. I mean, that, that was that was hardly going to be called on to be used by the damned. You didn't anything. have a dance routine. Oh, yeah, that was the thing. No. No. Did you guys ever have run-ins with Malcolm McLaren? Did he ever touch upon your lives? Well, we did several times. I mean, he, he uh, used to know some dodgy 
Vicar where we used to get a rehearsal room from in the early days. But, you know, Malcolm's one of these guys just full of bullshit, basically. And um, he's yeah, got the, way the gift of the, get, the, the mouth. He thinks he invent the way you, you know you sort of hear him reinvent the past as if without him it never would have existed yeah. when in actual fact there was a lot going on around there was, him, there was punk know. groups happening everywhere the buzzcocks in manchester there were stinky stinky toys yeah. in uh, in paris you know the ramones and all these people the damned the stranglers the jam all these people happening you know nothing to do with malcolm mclaren thank you very much he was he was really a good pr yeah. man he went to new york saw how they were doing it there uh -huh. and then kind of took that richard hell thing back to but I mean, without Johnny, he wouldn't have had anything there, really. You know, the Pistols were basically a heavy metal band with a weird singer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you take Johnny uh, off of that, it's just nothing. Yeah, I heard that a lot of different singers like actually auditioned for that part. He wanted, uh, didn't he want Richard Hell for for the the part of the band um, originally? Probably, yeah. I mean, he because he, he kept trying to bring Americans over. I mean, obviously, when we did the Anarchy in the UK too, he brought over the Heartbreakers and stuff. But. Uh, yeah, he was just a lucky, he was lucky to be in, in the right place at the right time. Plus, he was a little older, I think, than everybody else. He'd sort of been through a bit of the 60s, and he'd seen all this talent, and he, he found a way of exploiting it in, his, in the best way for himself as well. Don't you think it's amazing that his son is now a fashion designer, and that Vivian Westwood is, is considered royalty in the fashion industry after coming from the streets? Well, I always thought Vivian was very nice. Uh, you know, I mean, in fact, when, when Vivian used to work for him, he never used to kind of give her credit for oh, doing really? the stuff that she did. I didn't think so, you know, so. Um, he was just a credit hound, wasn't he? A little yeah. bit, yeah. Yeah, I think so. You hit the nail on the head there. Yeah. Currently, how did the deal with Nitro come about? Well, it came about because we, uh, we decided we were gonna make an album and some people I know knew that Dexter was, because he, you know, he'd done the, uh, the Batman thing where yeah. he recorded Smash It Up, that he had his own label and he was really interested. So we just talked to him and it was, it was very quick and easy. It was like, yeah, I'd love to do it. And uh, you know, something like six months later, there we were in the studio and getting it done. So how are they treating you guys so far? Oh, You're it's terrible, sensible. terrible. <laughs> they let me, I have to get, have permission to go to the toilet, yeah. you know, it's awful. They won't let me Rule drink. with an iron hand. Yeah. <laughs> They seem like pretty nice guys. I know Mitch Townsend over there pretty well. Yeah. And he's, it's, it seems like they just run everything real mellow. It's a nice little setup. Yeah, you know who you're talking to I, um, from the day-to-day -day stuff, so it's good. How did you recruit ex-Gun Club, ex-Sisters of Mercy bass player Patricia Morrison in the band? I joined the Sisters of Mercy. And how was that run for you? That was very difficult. It was a very difficult band to be in. Um, there wasn't much music involved in it. It was an awful lot of everything else. So it was kind of uh, soul-destroying in a way. I've been in the dam about five years, so I'm hoping this one I stay in longer. So this is a dream come true for you to be playing with these guys on stage. It is. It's, it's, it's gotten strange lately because for the longest time I was up there playing dam songs, but now I'm playing our songs. You know, the new yeah. ones, which that's, that's gotten very weird. I think of that sometimes like, oh God, you know, yeah. So I'm, I really actually feel like I am in the band now, like I'm part of it. Kind of a long story, but uh, <laughs> our, our bass player at the time decided he, he didn't wait. He, he had left the band several times before, but I guess we took him totally at his word this time when he said, I'll quit, I don't want to do it anymore. And Captain suggested that, because um, Patricia plays bass, that she, we should give her a go. And uh, she's been in the band ever since six years now. I think. Some great bass playing. Yeah, which has always been in good bands as well. I mean, as you said, the Gun Club, and then there was Legal Weapon before that. and. Uh, yeah, she's kind of, I know she's very well known out in LA. Everything she's done has been successful as well, so I'm rather hoping You were hoping she'll... it would rub off yeah. on <laughs> It's been great talking to you guys. Nice one. Sensible. Yeah, nice one, Eric. Dave, uh, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. come on, you uh, tight uh, I, I am, I'm afraid that uh, I'm not going to be able to give you any money today, you guys, because my car is about to break down. Is this the Blair Witch Project show? Yeah. Bubble. You know, everybody always says that, but I don't have the money from yeah. the from the, the movie, so uh, I, they wouldn't even let me be in it. You have to, have to do all that thing. <laughs> 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 Right on. The Blaring Out Show.